So I'm, uh, I'm Michael Vandenberg. I'm a professor here at, uh, at Vanderbilt and the co-instructor uh, with Linda Bregan of the Environmental Law and Policy Annual Review Park. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of Vanderbilt. We've got a great turnout, even though we're competing with one of the hottest events uh, at the law school in a while here. Um, and we do this in conjunction with the Environmental Law Institute, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in a minute. But what I just wanted to say very briefly is that our focus here that really matters for this event, we have a wonderful panel, is that we're trying to take the very best ideas from the academy and move them into the policy discourse and the real world. And we do that by sorting out the articles, taking the best ones that have some feasibility, uh, components to them, and we're trying to do that by decreasing um, the extent to which we reward uh, professors for writing articles like that, like Professor Kazulis today, and um, and then by getting them into dialogue with um, an annual event in D.C., which is about to come up in a few weeks, and then with publication in the August issue of the Environmental Law Reporter, which is the um, first or second most cited environmental law journal out there. So we think this is a great way to convey those ideas, and, and I love what I know we're about to hear in terms of taking the bankruptcy ideas of Professor Gazoulas and, and thrashing them out and talking about them to the panel today. So with that, I introduce uh, Linda Bregan, who is a senior um, uh, attorney with the Environmental Law Institute and the co-instructor of the Alpha Hall. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to just do some thank yous, especially to Kerrigan English, who's our symposium editor this year, for uh, putting this event together, and Maggie Milam, our Environment, Energy, and Land Use Program Coordinator, and Sydney Satterwhite. It truly takes a village to do these things. Um, and I just want to take a moment to thank the entire LPAR class. You all have just been absolutely wonderful to work with this year, and, um, and I just want to tell you how much that. We have enjoyed it. Uh, so the plan for today is that we're going to hear from Nick Summers, who's our incoming executive editor, about LPAR and how you can become a part of it if you are in 1L. And then Kerrigan's going to introduce our guest speakers. We're going to first hear from the author of the article for about 15 minutes and then from each of our expert commentators for about 10 minutes each. We're going to give you a chance to respond to what you've heard. And then Kerrigan's going to kick it off with questions, and then we'll um, have some time for audience questions. I do want to let you know it's being recorded, so uh, we'll go around the microphone if you have questions. Um, and I'm going to remind you all of these time frames so we stay on pace. Um, I know some of you have class, um, so just feel absolutely free to leave when you need to leave. We're just glad you could join us today. And then lastly, we are having an almost waste-free event today. Um, it turns out your chip bags have to go in the trash, but everything else can go in the compost um, bags that are green, and there's some out front as, as well. So um, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm going to hand it over to Nick Summer. Thank you, Professor Bregan. And um, Professor Vandenberg did an excellent overview of LPAR, so um, I just want to a little information about our write-on process that will be starting soon. Um, we plan to get our Brightspace page and our personal statement prompt up this week for all the 1Ls in the room. Um, you can get started on your personal statement over spring break. And the only other thing we're requiring as a part of our write-on process is your appellate briefs as a writing sample. So hopefully you'll already have that written. And we plan to open our write-on process a week before finals. And then it will continue through until the joint journal write-on process terminates after finals. Um, additionally, the next big write-on meeting will be on March 28th for all of you. Um, you know, we really hope that for all the one L's in the room that you all choose to participate in our write-on. Um, you know, LPAR is a fantastic opportunity, like Professor Greenberg said, um, to be able to help shape the academic and policy conversations that are happening around the nation on environmental issues, to connect policymakers with, with practical policy solutions, um, to develop important skills that will benefit you, benefit you in your careers, and also, um, you know, you get uh, experiential credits, which are unique uh, to LPAR among the journals. So those are just some benefits that you get from participating in LPAR, and we hope that uh, you all will choose to participate um, and write on, and that we will get many excellent candidates uh, to join us in LPAR class next year. Um, and without further ado, I will pass on to Kerrigan to, to introduce today's event. Thanks, all.
Hi, everyone. Thank you, Nick. Um, so I am very excited to kick off our panel event. And so thank you for everyone for joining us about uh, on this panel discussion concerning Professor Gazoulis's article, Going Concerns and Environmental Concerns, Mitigating Climate Change Through Bankruptcy Reform. My name is Kerrigan English, for those of y'all who do not know me, and I'm serving as LPAR Symposium Editor this year. Um, and I am honored to introduce each of our speakers before we jump into the presentation. Beginning with our author in the middle, um, Professor Alexander Gazoulis is an associate professor at the University of Missouri School of Law, where he teaches contracts, bankruptcies, bankruptcy, and business organizations. Prior to entering academia, Professor Gazoulis served as a law clerk to Judge William H. Walls, the U.S. District Court of the District of New Jersey. He served as an associate, first at Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison, and later at Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. He also served as a Stephen Gay Litigation Fellow at Americans United for Separation of Church and State, where he litigated First Amendment cases. Professor Gazoulis graduated from Harvard Law School. Going to the far end over there, William Norton III is a member of the Nashville, Tennessee office of Bradley Arant Bolton Cummings, LLP. He earned both his BA degree and JD degree from Vanderbilt University. Mr. Norton, Mr. Norton is an adjunct professor at Vanderbilt here where he teaches bankruptcy. Additional, additionally, Mr. Norton is the editor-in-chief of Norton Bankruptcy Law and Practice, the third edition, and co-wrote Norton's Creditor's Rights Handbook and is president of Norton's Institute on Bankruptcy Law. He is a fellow at the American College of Bankruptcy, a fellow of the Tennessee and National Bar Foundations, a past vice president of the National Bar Association, and a past chair of the ADR Committee for the National Bar Association. Finally, to my left right here is George Nolan. He serves as the director of the Tennessee Office of the Southern Environmental Law Center. SELC is a nonprofit, nonpartisan law firm rooted in and focused on the South, maintaining offices in six southeastern states and Washington, D.C. Before joining SELC, Mr. Norton was a member of Bolt Cummings, Connors, and Barry, PLC, and, Le and Leader, Fulso, and Nolan, PLC, where he practiced in the areas of plaintiffs, tort litigation, and commercial litigation. Mr. Nolan received his law degree from the University of Virginia as undergraduate degree from the University of Tennessee. Before I hand the mic over to Professor Kazulas, please welcome, please join me in welcoming each of our panelists. All right, thank you. And, and first, let me sincerely thank Professors Vandenberg and Bragan, uh, both of you and, and all the students who work at this journal. It's a real honor to be here. Um, so as mentioned, my article deals with the intersection from the bankruptcy and climate change. And, and so I will first present the problem as I see it at a high level um, without assuming a lot of bankruptcy background. And then I'll turn to the proposed solution and some justifications for it. Given the magnitude of the climate change problem, it's been heartening to see some commitments to the energy tra transition uh, by the government. Uh, the Paris Accords, for example, uh, on an international level, and executive branch commitments at, at a domestic level uh, in the recent administration. The question then becomes how we will transition from fossil fuels to uh, renewable sources of energy in time for the target date set. 2050 being uh, one particularly important target date. Assuming we're going to take a market-based approach, which I think is realistic, uh, there will have to be a point when renewables are reliably outcompeting fossil fuels. And there's some reason to be optimistic that they can. For one thing, fossil fuels are especially volatile, more volatile in terms of price than uh, renewables tend to be. Um, the price of oil and gas uh, swings fairly wildly. Uh, in our recent memory alone, uh, very recent memory, uh, the price of oil has been as low as $20 a barrel uh, around the early COVID uh, pandemic lockdowns, all the way up to $140 a barrel around the early days of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So these are massive swings. And as you might imagine, when the price really bottoms out, you do see a lot of firm failures uh, in the fossil fuel sector and a lot of encounters with the bankruptcy system. So the bankruptcy system ends up, um, given the boom and bust nature of this industry, often uh, resolving 
the distribution of the assets of these firms uh, when they uh, encounter these price shocks. We saw this play out particularly in the beginning of the pandemic when there was a wave of fossil fuel bankruptcies. Uh, a lot of producers uh, reorganized under Chapter 11. And this was a real opportunity to examine how uh, the intersection between bankruptcy and, and climate change tra and energy transition is, is going to work. And the results were fairly unequivocal. Most of these firms success successfully exited bankruptcy as uh, going concerns. Uh, their Chapter 11s were successful, and as I note in the article, uh, many of the publicly held firms and their <coughs> investor-facing documents e even expressed optimism at, at expanding their operations, having exited bankruptcy. So the price shocks we saw in 2020 really did not lead to fossil fuel assets being taken out of production. That, in, at the high level, is the problem I'm, I'm addressing in the uh, article because it, it does show a disconnect between our bankruptcy system doing what it's intended to do and our other commitments in other areas of the law to transition away from fossil fuels towards renewables. So again, I'd like to just, at a high level, talk about why this is happening because, again, uh, from a bankruptcy perspective, these are successful outcomes, and this is the system working as it's been designed to do. Um, in a business bankruptcy, the, uh, there's one large problem that cases uh, that the system is designed to solve, and that problem is the value destruction caused when one debtor business uh, owes a lot of money to other to many creditors and can't pay it all back. What tends to happen in that case outside of bankruptcy is a race between creditors and a race that takes place, in, a race that causes destruction of value that's, that's needless. Uh, to use a very generic and, and again, sim simplistic example, we can imagine a factory, a factory that produces widgets with specialized machinery. Uh, as it becomes clear that that factory can no longer pay all of its debts, uh, creditors are going to want to swoop in and take as much as they can before their other creditors do the same thing and their each creditor risks being left with nothing. We imagine a secured creditor taking machinery out of the factory that uh, had it that was subject to a security interest. Without that machinery, people start to walk away because the factory can no longer produce widgets. Other creditors come and take the tables and the chairs, and, and soon we have an empty building that has essentially no value, uh, nothing left to pay the remaining creditors who didn't act quickly. Bankruptcy intervenes to prevent this value destruction in, in two different ways at a high level. One is by allowing firms that still have value in them to reorganize, uh, reorganize their capital structures and their, their debt, exit bankruptcy, and continue to create value, uh, that value paying back uh, creditors who were owed at the event, at the insolvency. The other is to liquidate the firm, but to do it in an orderly way where assets are sold off, usually to other players in the same industry uh, that are willing to pay value for, for those assets. Again, either way, more value is preserved for creditors. Um, this is the system working as intended. But when we tr move from a generic factory producing nonspecific widgets to an extractive firm producing fossil fuels, we see the problem. Uh, the bankruptcy system intervenes to preserve production in a way that in other fields of law we have committed to transitioning away from. And this, this is the problem I, I see playing out in these uh, fossil fuel cases and where I think there's a lot of room for uh, amendments to the bankruptcy code to further our, our commitment to the energy transition. Uh, the article is, the rest of the article is devoted to uh, proposing some of those legislative solutions that could be made and arguing that they are relatively consistent with the existing structures and, and schemes within the code and therefore not a radical departure from what we're already doing. So uh, the first uh, core simple idea that I think uh, 
directly addresses what happened in 2020 would be to uh, create rules subjecting the fossil fuel industry and fossil fuel producers to a special reorganization schemes uh, and, and specifically to prohibit them from using this Chapter 11 mechanism to reorganize in bankruptcy. Um, Chapter 11 gives firms a lot of tools that they can use to um, remain as a going concern when they exit bankruptcy and, and remain productive. Um, we can simply uh, take those tools back and, may, and <coughs> prevent them from being used to preserve fossil fuel production. Um, this can be done as simply as, as an amendment to the code to say uh, that fossil fuel producers are not el eligible for Chapter 11. The reason I think this is a, a feasible and uh, reasonable amendment to the code is that we already do it with, with other industries. And, and a strong example is uh, stockbrokers and commodity brokers. These are also not allowed to reorganize in Chapter 11. There is a separate system through which they are resolved and liquidated in bankruptcy or out under a law called the Security Investors Protection Act. And the reason why that industry is treated <coughs> differently is quite ana analogous to uh, pollution. Uh, in effect, there's a concerns about contagion that are caused when stockbrokers uh, become insolvent, <coughs> contagion in the financial markets. This is a classic externality and uh, directly analogous to pollution, another classic externality. So borrowing from the treatment that already exists for stockbrokers and commodity brokers, I have proposed an amendment that uh, would block fossil fuel companies from using Chapter 11. Uh, now, a few things to note here. This wouldn't block them from liquidating in Chapter 7. Uh, and that also allow, that would also, um, they would also still be free if they're able to do so to reorganize consensually outside of bankruptcy. Um, this doesn't cut off the possibility entirely that assets would remain in production when a fossil fuel firm goes bankrupt, but it would increase the costs of, of doing that, and, and it would take away some tools that have resulted in uh, major profits for the fossil fuel industries while it recovers from price shocks. The other component I have addressed uh, I have included in the article is how to deal with liquidations. Again, liquidations are, are also a problem from a, a fossil fuel transition perspective uh, because in, in a liquidation, the bankruptcy system's goal is still to maximize value for creditors, which means selling off the debtor's assets to whoever's willing to pay the most. Um, not surprisingly, the, the entities willing to pay the most for um, fossil fuel extraction equipment and, and land are other fossil fuel companies. So even liquidations do uh, result in assets being kept in production of fossil fuels uh, when their original owner uh, has failed. Here I look for uh, an ex an, a precedent in the way the bankruptcy system has always treated railroads. and. Railroads have always been, uh, railroad insolvencies have always been governed by separate rules in the code, going back to earlier bankruptcy laws. And this special treatment for the railroad industry arises out of its, its public importance and importance to the economy, particularly that it played in earlier phases of American history. I think Analogous arguments can be made about the public importance of, of the energy transition now, so it's an appropriate comparison. Uh, in railroad cases, uh, bankruptcy proceedings are required to uh, consider the public interest, and importing a public interest considerations into fossil fuel uh, in, into fossil fuel proceedings, I think would have many. Uh, positive effects in addressing some of the problems we're, we're thinking about here. Um, the idea would be to find a way to liquidate insolvent fossil fuel companies in the bankruptcy system without having their assets all go to another competitor who's going to use them in the same way. Can some of these assets be sold to other firms that are not going to use them to continue to produce fossil fuels and therefore not take advantage of the bankruptcy system to 
uh, reach results that impede our uh, stated goals in other sectors of the law. Again, a public interest uh, requirement, which is an, in current law unique to railroads, but could be imposed on fossil fuel proceedings as well, uh, might go some way into uh, advancing that uh, goal. The final analogy in the paper uh, that I have uh, is to uh, some of the mass tort cases that have also proceeded through in bankruptcy. And here uh, I want to make the point that the bankruptcy system already has to deal with cases where uh, the debtor uh, primary line of business is one that society does not want to continue. Uh, a good example that's, that's ongoing right now and has been uh, one of the rare high-profile bankruptcy cases is the Purdue Pharma case. Uh, in that case, uh, the creditors are mostly victims of the company. Uh, they're the tort victims who uh, were uh, harmed by the opioid crisis that Purdue um, contributed to through its marketing. The tension in a case like that is that uh, the very mechanism by which the debtor firm created profits uh, is the same mechanism that injured the, the creditor victims. And so uh, there's a choice to be made between reorganizing the firm, maximizing uh, the value able to pay the judgments of creditors, versus the need to cut off the harmful business practices that caused the uh, case in the first place. I think, again, there's an analogy here between uh, the problem with fossil fuel cases where we do still want to maximize value for creditors, but at the same time, there's a need to move away from the original business model that these assets were used in. Um, the bankruptcy system has been able to do that in, in some mass tort, tort cases imperfectly, but, but with some success. And I think it could be done here um, with relatively simple, um, and, and by simple, I don't mean easy to pass, but, but relatively uh, simple. Uh, amendments to the bankruptcy code that I, that I outline in the paper. Um, the final part of the paper, and I, I see I'm coming close to it, close to time here. The final part of the paper deals with potential objections. Um, I think there are, in particular, um, intuitive ex objections to singling out particular industries for special treatment. Uh, it, it, is something that happens all the time with the code already. Um, so in addition to the examples that I have given with railroads and uh, stockbrokers, the code is full of special rules that apply to special industries, family farmers, uh, auto lenders. Uh, again, there are many uh, existing provisions that apply only with respect to certain industries. So I think there's a case to be made here, particularly given the uh, overwhelming public need we have to facilitate the ener energy transition as quickly as possible. Um, I hope the amendments here are, are ones that um, get some traction. Uh, but even more broadly, I, I think the broader question of uh, the interaction between bankruptcy and the climate change goals it has been under-examined. And if there's a, a secondary goal of the paper, it's just to um, spark more conversations around this problem. Uh, it's not a problem, again, coming back to what I said at the beginning, it's not a, necessarily a problem of the bankruptcy system being misused. In most of these cases, it's working as intended to solve the problem it was designed to solve. Um, but it is in great tension with uh, the goals we have set to, uh, and, and the goals that are very urgent, uh, which is to transition as quickly as possible away from fossil fuels. So uh, again, thank you all for being here. And I'm really looking forward to the uh, comments from, from both of you. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Norton, I'll hand the mic over to you. Yes, um, and you know, congratulations on the article. I thought it was very interesting, and, and actually learned a, a lot about uh, the development of other areas of, that are specifically addressed, as he mentioned, uh, in in bankruptcy cases. The the first thing that I was focusing on was, all right, uh, is this feasible? 
what what is the likelihood that this could be um, statutorily uh, dealt with? And, and my conclusion is, yeah, I think it probably could be for the reasons that he stated. There's there's sections, uh, definition sections under the bankruptcy code that define different types of assets and things like <coughs> single asset real estate and other uh, things that you could define uh, this particular uh, type of industry and as a debtor. Uh, there's a section on dealing with specific types of debtors and how they can be treated and how they can file in a bankruptcy. Uh, section 109 allows, uh, specifies that and you can make, uh, exclude them from filing Chapter 11 and, and uh, this particular definition that falls into play. Another important aspect of uh, the uh, um, his article was dealing with having a trustee that once the trustee takes over the assets in a Chapter 7 case, uh, be um, kind of required to reflect and do policies based on the climate change and not just maximizing value to the creditors. And I think that becomes probably uh, a very important aspect of the implementation of this uh, process because uh, what you're looking at in most cases of, of the other examples for like railroads, um, it was passed, uh, the bankruptcy law kind of evolved from federal laws dealing with railroads and, and the necessity of, particularly during World War II, of making sure there's free transit of troops and supplies and everything. You couldn't have a Chapter 7 bankruptcy that all of a sudden took out a section of, uh, you know, of the railroad tracks um, and then eliminated your ability to use those trains. So they made them into, forced them into Chapter 11 where uh, they couldn't, couldn't be liquidated in a Chapter 7. And that continues to this day, probably less needed now, but that law uh, continues. So that's kind of the opposite uh, impact of what, what he's proposing. The one that's very similar, though, is the uh, security SIPC regulations that existed and dealing with uh, commodities and, and um, securities um, and enforcing them into liquidation as opposed to reorganization. Now, one of the advantages there, or one of the reasons I think that that, that, that law continued in the bankruptcy, is there's a market uh, to determine the fair value of all those assets. And so you, you don't really need a reorganization. You're going to be liquidated. There's going to be fair value that's going to be realized to the parties because there's a market that already controls that. So for that reason, it, it made sense just to say, all right, well, we're just going to let them liquidate. Um, and and the, the creditors will get their fair value um, and, and not necessarily a need for Chapter 11. Um, I think the, one of the problems here is that by you, if you were to uh, appoint a trustee to do enforce uh, the liquidation, uh, that trustee is really not, is going contrary to what most of the bankruptcy laws are, uh, are designed to do, and that's to maximize value. And in this case, they're really, in many instances, to accomplish the result would be to minimize the value. Um, and, you know, for example, um, you wouldn't, uh, you, you don't sell oil rigs to other producers. You sell it to uh, fishing or environmental groups uh, to can, you know, who would use it to uh, do for environmental reasons as opposed to developing oil and other reasons. Obviously, it's going to be less value if you do that. Um, or, you know, big properties, they have to be sold to a, a, a solar farms or something as opposed to oil and gas. Um, or that in some instances you would have to abandon wells and plug them as opposed to allow them to be used uh, in the future for other reasons. So that obviously is contrary to 
to some of the things that what what creditors and the debtor are going to be seeking to try to accomplish in doing a sale. So um, that that obviously presents the biggest I think issue and in, in friction between uh, the environmental and and then the bankruptcy uh, of of reaching the it may be feasible, but I'm not. <coughs> Question is whether this can be accomplished um, in, in, in the result that you want for the impact that you want to try to, to deal with. The problem I think that you would find is that most of the debtors, um, obviously shareholders, motivated board of directors, they enter into a zone of insolvency where they're, they have a fiduciary duty to maximize value. That would uh, obviously give them some uh, concern, and, and uh, you would have to, I think, pass laws say under uh, these circumstances, you're not trying to maximize for the value of the of creditors, but for mm -hmm. society uh, is your goal. Um, and they would opt to perhaps do something other than Chapter 7. They don't have to file Chapter 7. They would go into the state court um, receivership of some sort uh, and deal with it there. Uh, you also have the secured creditors, um, and most people, why do they file bankruptcy? Well, they file bankruptcy because the secured creditor is trying to foreclose, and, and they need to file bankruptcy to stay that action and buy them some time to where they can then maximize their value, either through, um, you know, it's a very volatile, so they sit there and wait for the market to change, and, and bankruptcy gives them that a period of time to do it, uh, or they find uh, maybe do a sale uh, of, of a more, other than a foreclosure that a bank would do, a, a more advertised sale where they can maximize value. So those would be often the reasons that they would move into it, and uh, so the creditors would probably be <coughs> certainly resistant to uh, this kind of procedure as well, because um, at one point I was thinking, well, all right, if the debtor's not going to file, what could you do? There is a process called involuntary, where uh, maybe you could get, but then the question is, well, who would be bringing that involuntary? Normally, it's uh, there's a ju jurisdictional amount of 18,000 or so of claims of unsecured creditors that could assert uh, the claim and, and push somebody into bankruptcy. I don't know whether creditors are going to be motivated to do that. You may even uh, give a right to some, um, I don't know, uh, environmental group or something to, to, to be able to bring an involuntary uh, that could uh, force it. Uh, but that, would, that might be the, one of the only ways in which you could force someone into doing uh, this procedure. Uh, so that it could be beneficial, but uh, so it's it's of course then you've obviously got the trying to we've, we've been trying to pass some technical amendments in bankruptcy for 20 years and we can't get that done, much less try to get anything else done. But uh, in any case, uh, it is very interesting to just talk about, and I uh, I think feasibility-wise, it is something that could be accomplished if we could get it passed. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nolan. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm so honored to be here and participate in this panel, and I just want to thank Professor Gazulez for um, the absolutely fascinating article. The ideas are so good on so many different levels, and um, I, I'm just very grateful for your, your scholarship and your creativity. Um, so I'm a lawyer with the Southern Environmental Law Center, and before I became a public interest environmental lawyer, um, I had another life where I was um, did a lot of heavy litigation here in Nashville in a big corporate firm. I did a lot of plaintiff's tort litigation and other types of litigation. And one of the best things about being at that firm is that Bill Norton was one of my law partners for several years. So. Um, we had this leading expert in the bankruptcy sphere, and I had a few experiences where 
a tortfeasor defendant that I was suing would pull me into bankruptcy court where I felt very out of place and, and unfamiliar and didn't want to be, and I would go straight to Bill's office, and he frequently had a really cool bankruptcy judo move that we could pull <laughs> on the other side, and it was, yeah, it was really, uh, really fun. Um, so a little bit about uh, SELC. Um, so we're a nonpartisan public interest law firm, and basically what we do is we represent other nonprofits, community groups, conservation org organizations, um, environmental groups, uh, in litigation and advocacy contexts at no charge to them. So uh, we think that's an important model because we think that, that other nonprofits need access to law firms and lawyers and courts um, in, in, in a situation where they can avoid the economic friction which is so terribly intense in our legal system. And a big part of what we do is work on the climate change problem. And we have teams of lawyers in our six region states that focus on that sort of work. Um, personally, most of my work centers around water protection. But because I'm the director of our Tennessee office, I keep up with the climate change work we do here and also as an organization. Um, and that climate change work uh, takes a variety of forms. Um, we, uh, the lawyers who work in the states that are not Tennessee uh, <clears throat> on the climate change issue spend a lot of time before state public utility commissions, uh, which regulate the for-profit power companies in those regions. And so they use those proceedings in order to encourage uh, rate structures and policies uh, and other uh, uh, legal mechanisms to push the power companies toward adopting more carbon neutral renewable sources of energy such as wind and solar. Uh, we have a team that's devoted to uh, resisting offshore uh, oil drilling in the Atlantic uh, along our southern states as well as in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we have a team that advocates before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, which as many of you may know is the federal agency that authorizes uh, fossil fuel pipeline companies, for example, to uh, uh, build pipelines and actually give those companies certificates that allow them then to employ the power of eminent domain in order to build fossil fuel pipelines. And we here in Tennessee um, frequently advocate and work with and sue and push the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, it's currently in the process of winding down and closing its outdated coal burning power plants, um, but it appears to have made a decision to make a hard pivot toward uh, burning fracked methane gas as the replacement fuel for that. Um, so we engage in a variety of um, processes under NEPA to encourage them to uh, consider the climate impacts of, of, of what they are doing. Um, and there's kind of a common theme among all that environmental climate change work, which is that the fossil fuel industry is entrenched. Um, it, it, is, it is sticky. <clears throat> so our laws and our processes um, make it very difficult to push those companies to move in a more creative and sustainable direction. So, um, you know, for example, TVA, as it is uh, in the midst of this massive methane gas build out where it's building these power plants, it has to go to the bond market. 
um, to raise capital in order to make those investments. And when it does that, it's going to um, incur li long-term liabilities to its bondholders that it will have to pay over the long term. So th that is just one example of how these, these, these decisions, once they get made, become very entrenched. And one thing I was very interested to learn from your article, Professor, is the extent to which Chapter 11 is a subsidy for the fossil fuel industry. I, I mean, I was familiar with Chapter 11, but I just didn't really, it didn't occur to me the extent to which our bankruptcy code is subsidizing uh, companies from uh, uh, d during the times when, the, when there are price falls in fossil fuels and just the long-term implications of that. Um, another thing that struck me about your article is kind of the commonality between what your article seeks to do and what our advocacy does, which is pushing decision makers to consider climate change as part of the big picture. Um, so much of what we do is resisting efforts by power companies and, and the fossil fuel industry not to look at climate change when it, when it is assessing the uh, impacts of the decisions that they make. So I think introducing that into the bankruptcy conversation is very, uh, uh, very important. And I was particularly interested in the analogy you drew between the fossil fuel companies and uh, the railroads, uh, particularly given that both of those industries enjoy the power of eminent domain in order for them to build out their infrastructure. Um, and we at SCLC have uh, successfully gotten in the middle of some of the eminent domain proceedings in order to resist pipeline projects. We did that three years ago in Memphis when there was a big crude oil pipeline that was going to go through southwest Memphis um, called the Bahalia Pipeline that was actually going to help transport crude oil from Cushing, Oklahoma into Tennessee, across Tennessee, and down to the Louisiana coast. Uh, so presumably much of that oil could be uh, transported to Asia um, or refined there on the coast. And um, as we uh, started looking for tools to resist that project, we figured out that unlike in many other states, uh, crude oil pipeline companies don't enjoy the power of eminent domain under Tennessee state law, under our various statutes. So we got in the way of, um, of their ability to condemn property for their easement. So I thought it's, it's, it was a very apt analogy for you to kind of seize on how the bankruptcy code tr treats railroads. Um, another thing that your article mentions is the present um, hostility, I think, that some recent U.S. Supreme Court decisions have exhibited toward the administrative authority of federal agencies. Um, and that is a thing in administrative law now. And I think uh, given that dynamic, looking for other ways to encourage market solutions to deal with the climate change problem. <laughs> uh, and your article also raised some questions for me. <clears throat> um, and I guess one of the questions that I'll just kind of throw out there is, I'm wondering if your suggestions were adopted, um, what would be the long-term effect on the credit markets that uh, fossil fuel companies could tap into? Um, you know, would it, uh, uh, I, I imagine the effect on credit markets could be a pro and a con um, for what you're suggesting. 
And I've always wondered if lending institutions really care about bankruptcy very much when they're making lending decisions because they're probably not planning on going through a Chapter 7 or a Chapter 11. And would it really affect the, the, the availability of credit? Uh, so that, that's just a question that I had, and I've got some others for our discussion. But um, again, thank you very much for your scholarship and, and for everyone to let me chime in. Professor Kuzula, is your response? Well, thank you both so much. Uh, really <coughs> helpful, insightful, and, and important points, and, and fortunately ones that I think I can sort of respond to together. Um, I think it's, it's absolutely right that we shouldn't lose sight of the uh, legacy of subsidies that the fossil fuel industry has enjoyed and how that impacts uh, a current expectation that renewables can compete in the short term on an open marketplace with them. And by subsidies, I don't just mean monetary, although that's certainly there, but something like a legacy of having enjoyed eminent domain power uh, for a long time. Um, in light of that, I think we should think through uh, the impact of reforms partially in terms of how to unwind subsidies or, or restore a, a more balanced competition between uh, fossil fuels and, and renewables. So when it, when it comes to an important point such as uh, the ability of debtors to avoid bankruptcy, creditors uh, who would likely most of the time would not be eager to uh, or, or would be eager to do a workaround outside of bankruptcy under this proposal, uh, proceed under state law if possible, do consensual reorganizations. Uh, at least in situations where no one interested can trigger an involuntary. Uh, I think that's a result we can live with. Because I think when we see something like uh, what we saw in 2020, where uh, all of these firms are using Chapter 11, they're doing it because they're getting some advantages out of Chapter 11. Chapter 11 works well. Uh, it affords uh, powers such as cram downs that are not available outside of bankruptcy. Uh, it allows uh, debtors to do things that are harder or more costlier to do uh, if they're doing it outside of bankruptcy. And so a, a default where they're having to try and do this outside of bankruptcy, again, we can see as a, something of an unwinding of all the legacy advantages this industry has enjoyed, uh, potentially increasing the risk that creditors bear when they lend to these um, uh, firms and thereby, again, potentially restoring some competitive advantage to, to renewables that we want to see. Uh, in terms of uh, feasibility in general, I think we should approach all of these uh, reforms as uh, from the perspective of being able to get what we can. Uh, if it became possible to put only the chapter, uh, only the portion of these proposals that uh, kept uh, firms from reorganizing in Chapter 11 in the code and there wasn't consensus to get the uh, public interest and environmental trustee provisions. I think, again, that would be a step in the right direction, would again increase the costs and therefore do some work to unwind the uh, legacy advantages that will play a role in determining uh, the threshold point when renewables become uh, competitive in, in relation with um, fossil fuels. And then finally, on the point of, of the challenge of a trustee uh, being asked to, uh, for example, sell an oil rig to a fishery when it would make more value sold to another oil firm, it's certainly a challenge in that most of the bankruptcy structure is organized around the idea of getting as much value as possible. But again, it, it is a, a problem that is addressed in, in something like Purdue, where you, know, you would get the most value out of reorganizing Purdue as something that looked like old Purdue. It was a profitable company for a long time. But instead, uh, the goal in a mass tort like that is, is to have a reorganized company uh, structured in a way that operates under limitations that avoid the, the problem in the first place. So I, I, I certainly agree that it's it's a challenge for the trustee uh, in were we to adopt this approach, but I don't think it's an insurmountable one. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I think 
again, just want to close by thanking you both again for, for Absolutely. really inter interesting and insightful comments. And I think Kerrigan is going to start us off with a comment, and maybe we'll take some from the audience. Yes. Uh, so first, can we thank each of our panelists? <laughs> All right, so I have two quick questions, and then we'll turn it over to our lovely audience to ask uh, ones that they have. Uh, my first one is directly towards Professor Pizzoulis, and our commenters can chime in if they wish. Um, so kind of this discussion has raised some of the objections and concerns regarding your proposal. I think Professor Norton actually articulated an ongoing tension within environmental law and its crossover with bankruptcy and corporate law more generally. Um, being like whether shareholders should maximize value or board of directors should maximize value or focus on societal measures and which is more important moving forward. Aside from these, you mentioned a number of other objections and concerns in section five of your article. Uh, would you mind articulating a little bit more on this point? Because I think you got to it at the very end and how these concerns can be avoided. So one, one concern that I think is, is widespread uh, across any proposal for environmental and climate change concerns, and so, so it's probably the one I'll, I'll focus on, is uh, how do we get it passed? Um, and there, uh, I think there's, there's probably uh, not, I don't want to make any forecasts, but this is probably not a this Congress or maybe even next Congress um, uh, enactment. Uh, that's probably true of virtually any um, climate change mitigation proposal we could come up with. So I don't think that's a non-starter, but it's something to acknowledge up front. Um, when we're in the world of, of what could be passed in the medium term, uh, subsidies are probably w what we've seen the most success with. But I think there's reason to, I, I mean, I'm a believer in that to a point, but I think there's reason to doubt that that alone is sufficient. Uh, and so the question is, what's next in, in uh, feasible things that could potentially pass, be passed in the medium term? Uh, one thing that recommends this approach is it can be marketed, it can be sold to the public as a market-based approach. Uh, there's some research to suggest that's more likely to be passed. And not only market-based, but it, the operation here is, is really targeted at firms that fail on their own and then use the bankruptcy system. And there, there's, less into, there, there's less reason to uh, defend a firm that has failed to meet its obligations in the marketplace on its own. Um, it, it's easier to, to point at those firms and say those are the ones that should go first. Uh, and so I, I think there's some, some ways that this proposal could be sold politically um, that might be a harder stretch for other types of climate change reform. Great. Thank you. I think that was a great answer. And I have one other quick one, and then I will give the mic to you. Uh, and this is open for all three of our panelists. Uh, this article is a wonderful example of how interdisciplinary the law is becoming and how many subject matter crossovers there are. And so what advice do you all have for current law students who are entering into this increasingly complex legal field? Well, I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, um, when, you, when you enter into your legal practice, particularly early on, I, I just can't recommend enough just staying open and nimble and, and open-minded to assignments in areas that you didn't envision yourself practicing in. Uh, I think it was, it was formative for me when I was starting in, in litigation that I, I ended up being kind of put on matters that I didn't necessarily have a background in or found myself developing an expertise in something just by happenstance and then um, pivoting to something else. And, and again, that open experience, uh, I think it, it was helpful for me becoming a better practitioner, but also now in academia, uh, I think makes me a little more open to other fields and other cross-disciplinary ideas, uh, like you mentioned, and I'd be eager to Hear your thoughts well, I think there's some real value to develop some kind of specialty, um, whether it be environmental, bankruptcy, some area of getting into, even in litigation. Uh, I was surprised to find out at one point I was head of the litigation group in the firm, and 
we were talking about, well, marketing and how many different areas of litigation are there. And it turned out there were 28, you know, and I was sitting there, but good Lord, I can't believe it. it diff 28 different areas of litigation, you know, whether it be tax litigation or environmental litigation or antitrust litigation, you know, everybody has their own little specialty. And, and that, I think, is what, what you end up uh, is not only are you, you become recognized and, and in a big firm, uh, the other partners are your biggest source of business. So you want to maintain your relationships within that firm. That, that is very critical. Uh, you want to get involved in, in the various organizations that deal with that specialty, uh, whether it be, of course, there's the general bar associations and all of that where you get to know people and, and referrals all come. Uh, from that, uh, but uh, it can't, it's, it's all based on ultimately relationships and getting out there and getting to know your own attorneys within your firm as well as uh, other practitioners in the community and, and nationwide programs, particularly if you're environmental, there's going to be all kinds of nationwide uh, programs that you can uh, travel to and be a part of, and it's very easy to get involved in that. It's just a matter of showing up, and before you know it, in a couple of years, you're, you know, president of the committee, and then before that, you're, you're, you know, president of the whole organization. You know, it just, it, it's all because you're willing to uh, be involved and be present uh, when they do have their meetings. Uh, that is, is I can't s stress enough how important that has been in my career. I know. I'll add maybe a little bit of a counterpoint to what Professor Norton <laughs> just said. Um, having a specialty is, is important, but as you're starting your career, um, if you can get into a situation where you get to be a generalist and learn a lot of different stuff, um, that's a good thing. And you can do that if you go work for a legal department of the city or an AG's office or a big law firm or whatever path your career takes. I think it's good early in your career to have an open mind and get exposed to different types of legal problems because every time you learn a new system or a new statutory scheme, you're just going to be a better lawyer at the end of that project. Um, and as, as Bill said, relationships, the law is all about relationships. You just can never have too many friends. So. <laughs> Just keep that in mind as you in, move in forward. In law and in life. That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> so we have only two minutes left. Does anyone have a quick question? And if not, I'm assuming you all can hang out for at least a little while. I think one of you has a hearing, but uh, uh, to take some questions. Uh, but does anyone have a quick question to wrap up? Mike? Uh, I think one of our students had a question. Oh, <laughs> well, yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you're talking about trustee sales and comparing sort of the public value of a resale might say one thing, but the shareholder value or financial value might say another, um, sort of what, what's most valuable in that, in that resale, do you, that seems like an opportunity for, a, a, you know, the federal government to say, okay, well, here's a tax incentive to make up that gap because we're here to sort of raise that externality, I guess. Is there, are there other areas in the bankruptcy code that, there are tax incentives for certain types of sales compared to others that would be a precedent for that. Or say the federal government says, you get a tax incentive if, if this asset is repurposed for geothermal versus resold to a, a, another fossil fuel practice. Well, it's not so much uh, tax incentives, but I'll just throw this out. The main reason that I ever run into an environmental issue is on the issue whether it's a claim or a government enforcement of a of the police powers. If it's a claim, it can be discharged and eliminated, and the obligation disappears, now, which is obviously an advantage in bankruptcy. If it's not a claim and it's a part of the police powers, then it continues. It's not discharged. It's, it's something that the government can continue to enforce. So in the environmental world in bankruptcy, that's where I end up getting a lot more, and this is why this has been kind of interesting to be involved in, in, a, in something that does deal with it in a separate light. Um, so that, 
I mean, that's kind of the, the world that we deal with. So it's not so much a tax, but it's the enforceability to continue to force that uh, and not be stayed by the bankruptcy provisions that stops normal creditors from enforcing their rights. Yeah, and, and it is it is a, an interesting point that if 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 an extra ban if a non bankruptcy regime resulted in it being more valuable to convert an oil rig for a, um, pro environmental goals rather than transitioning it for further extraction. Um, if you achieve that outside of bankruptcy, that result should hold even under current bankruptcy. Even without these reforms, a trustee would seek to maximize value. And if you maximize value by not putting assets into fossil fuel production, in that sense, you've, you've probably won the battle already. Um, so yes, if you could make that work, um, that would get to some of these problems as well. Uh, and maybe eliminate the need for the special environmental trustee. That would probably be expensive, and, and um, I'm not sure you could get there just with tax subsidies because tax credits are, um, you know, very useful if you have a lot of profits. Not that useful if you don't owe taxes because you have losses and, and that sort of thing. So, so you probably couldn't get there only through tax subsidies, but. If you had a way to affect the underlying economics, that that could work. It would be. I wonder if one other reason why that might be uh, valuable is that it, might you be able to avoid reconciliation or get it through reconciliation, avoid a filibuster that way. So that you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, Bill, you would know this. Do bankruptcy code reforms? I assume those are substantive law. They're subject to the sixty vote filibuster override. So that I mean, one reason why we have yeah. subsidies getting through Congress and almost nothing else is. You only need 51 votes, not 60. I'm just curious about whether this approach might be a way to get past them. Right. And, and the idea would essentially be buying off, um, and, and, and I don't know if it would trigger only on a firm's insolvency or be a general buy off that any fossil fuel extraction, uh, we'd pay you to not do it. Uh, that would be an, a, probably an expensive approach, and for that matter, subject to criticism. But may be easier to advance given the reconciliation angle. Um, it's an interesting or they'll award a couple years from now when you finish okay. that. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, thank you for the really thoughtful comments and for writing such an interesting article. And thank you all for joining us.